Good evening, everyone. We are now in night number seven, which means we have just passed the halfway point. Yesterday evening was our halfway point, and the meetings end this uh, Friday. Of course, on Saturday morning, we will have uh, one more session, but Friday evening will be the final evening meeting that we have for this series. I'd like to welcome each and every one of you here once again. Uh, along with all of those who join us via the live streaming. Thank you for joining us, and we continue to study Jesus on prophecy. Another reminder again, I know for those of you who have been here, uh, it might get a little bit repetitive here, but in case you're coming new or you've missed a few nights, just a reminder that refreshments are available in the family center and children's meetings are downstairs. And as soon as the meeting is over, please go and collect your children and then come and join uh, us for fellowship in the family center. Okay, registration, hopefully all of you are clicking in. If any of you have missed the night or two, I think Friday evening was night number five when we started, but in case you've missed one or two, whenever your fifth night comes up, make sure you ask at the registration desk for your free DVD. And the same goes for when you reach night number 10. Make sure you let them know about the second DVD as well. Now, this evening, we're going to be blessed again uh, for the third time with Dr. Ryan Hayes, professor of chemistry. And uh, tonight's topic is going to be about proteins. Where do proteins come from and why are they so significant in dealing with this issue of creation and science? And what can that tell us? Now, just as an added feature to this, we will be, after the program ends, we will be doing some video recordings on the organ side right here at the front. Um, just wanted to make you aware of that. You don't have to uh, immediately vacate from that area, but try not to you know, stare in the cameras, make any faces. Uh, if you have any children and you're bringing them up, make sure they don't run past there. But we want to make these nice little short video clips that we can then upload to our church website and stuff, which kind of summarizes what these uh, reasons to believe topics have been so that they can inspire faith to many people uh, beyond our physical location right here. Now, the online streaming, again, it's not too late. Uh, if someone else comes to your mind, even on the last evening, remember, you can refer them to our YouTube page or you can refer them to our online streaming page and they can get all of the previous presentations available there. Uh, if you have any comments or questions, please text them in to this number. We would love to hear from you. And on that note as well, the last few evenings that we have been talking about uh, the state of the dead, what happens when you die, or hellfire, and also about the second coming, uh, we have amazing resources by the resource table uh, over there in the connecting corridor. And so as you make your way over to the refreshments, make sure you check these out if you would like further information on them. They're available there. Um, these are some really heavy but really amazing topics which really make Jesus shine. Uh, on that note as well, uh, Matt and Josie Minicus are with us for the last time this evening to share their music. So. We have really appreciated them being with us and make sure that as you leave, if you want to take some of their music with you, that you also stop by the same desk which has this material, you will be able to pick up their CDs there. So um, that way you can listen to them at your own pleasure and convenience. Once again, silence your cell phones. Uh, let's minimize the distractions and uh, let's prepare our hearts now as, and our minds as we seek to understand where do proteins come from. Hello, hello again. I'm Ryan Hayes. As I've mentioned before, I teach chemistry here at Andrews University for the last 10 years, and as I've mentioned before, I've been practicing for 25 years being a chemist, and so I haven't gotten it right, so I guess I'm gonna to have to keep doing it. And uh, I enjoy teaching it, enjoy uh, being a chemist, and I just love the insight that uh, I've been learning over the years on how things work. I guess I just wanna know how things work, and chemistry provides that understanding that I appreciate, and I hope you will too. So uh, uh, I need to tell you, uh, well, so our, our title, Where Does Protein Come From? And uh, I should tell you that I'm a vegetarian, I was a non-vegetarian up until the age of 14. Did that sound weird to say I was a non-vegetarian? You, you know, I had an Indian friend, this is how they 
he taught me, he said, yeah, we're, we, we go non-veg once in a while. Uh, when you go to college, some of the, my Indian friends go non-veg. And because, uh, you know, I normally would say I uh, ate meat up until I was 14, but saying non-vegetarian changes the reference. It's funny how our words reflect our reference and what is normal. Our society, it feels like, is based around meat. When I became a full-fledged vegetarian, I was at a public high school, and it was kind of challenging, but I had a lunch lady uh, who was my aunt, and she helped me with some salads, figuring that's what you needed to eat. And so I was thankful for that. Uh, everyone was really worried about where I was going to get my protein and wondered if I was going to shrivel up and die from malnutrition. I think things have been getting a little bit better since the 1980s, but our world is still revolving around meat. Uh, I think, uh, well, there's been uh, studies on uh, where meat comes from and which countries are eating meat and how much. And in the United States, as you can see on this graph here, sort of maybe uh, ta uh, tailing off a little bit, but still a lot of meat per person. And a lot of countries like uh, Brazil and China uh, just really increasing the amount of meat per person uh, that is consumed. So the meat consumption really worldwide is going up meat production around the world is definitely increasing in all areas, um, definitely since the last couple of decades. The world just loves to eat meat, and as the world gets so-called richer, more meat is consumed. But it does appear that the U.S. is kind of switching the type of meat that they're eating, and in these graphs it looks like there's a switch over, the amount of beef is going down and more poultry is being consumed. But they're still eating lots of it. Uh, here are some things that my extended family and friends and co-workers have said about this over the years, because when I told them that, uh, they had said, well, if God didn't want us to eat animals, then why did he make them out of meat? <laughs> All right? And I, I had a boss, and uh, if, he ever, if he sees this, you know, uh, Bob Barry, he would always tell me, my, my boss they had uh, when I was working in industry, he says, look here, we got these really sharp canine teeth. This is why we're designed to eat meat. It rips and tears. And uh, if you know anything about canine teeth and meat eaters, they, this is, these are not really, they're called canines, but they're not, they really don't function that way. Um, and then, of course, everyone was asking, where did you get your protein? You're a vegetarian. So growing up in Michigan, I've learned that, uh, I, I, that protein comes from meat. That's what I learned growing up. Beef, chicken, turkey, hot dogs, whatever kind of meat that is. Um, and some other types of meat. You could just, this is where you get it. Plants don't have protein. And then I learned that maybe nuts had some protein, so you should eat nuts. And then uh, maybe pr peanut butter and jelly sandwiches have a little bit of protein in it. But that's about all I knew growing up. I didn't know where this obsession with protein has come from in our society, but as you probably have noticed in the markets, uh, that people want and will pay more for protein in their food. You just look at cereals, you look at protein bars, uh, all sorts of things, more protein in it, it costs more. Uh, it just has a huge obsession with protein. Well, I've since learned where protein comes from, and I want to share that with you because it's an amazing chemical journey. And protein starts in the air. See, our air is 80%, uh, actually 78% nitrogen. And uh, this nitrogen in the air is an interesting little molecule. It is actually two nitrogen atoms fused together with a triple bond. This triple bond is very hard to break. It's essentially unusable. And there's a lot of it there. In fact, tons and tons. It's just an, uh, an amazing amount of, uh, of nitrogen. All animals breathe in this nitrogen, and they breathe it out. It does nothing for you in this direct way. Plants, same way. Plants, quote unquote, breathe it in. They take in these gas, this gas. It's a gas. It's not a protein. It's just nitrogen atoms, and they breathe it out and does nothing for them. I found a quote from a textbook that said, it's one of nature's great ironies that most life forms, including all plants and animals, are unable to use this dinitrogen gas in their life-sustaining biochemical processes. However, a way has been made. The nitrogen in the air can be chemically transformed into something usable, like ammonia and some other things, by a special type of bacteria Okay, oh, there's our triple bond of nitrogen. A special type of bacteria that lives in the roots of legume plants. This bacteria is called the rhizobium bacteria. 
And uh, it lives in a special little capsule found in the roots of these soybean plants. Well, not just soybeans, but legumes and nitrogen-fixing uh, plants. Legumes, just a fancy word for beans, by the way, if you didn't know. The rhizobium bacteria cooperates with the plants in an amazing process, okay? And then we eat these, okay? This is called nitrogen fixation. And we then consume these plants that have had this chemically transformed nitrogen, and it's been transformed into something we call protein. This is a, an amazing chemical journey that I wanna go into in just a little bit more detail. Because I could stop here and that'd probably be enough, but not enough for me. And uh, we should really see what's going on here. So uh, as we consume it, then we process it and it goes back in the ground and then it goes into this whole nitrogen cycle. And so uh, this rhizobium bacteria is, is a really cool looking bacteria. It's what's called a rod shape. And I'm not sure if it's necessarily green, but uh, and it has special requirements to live and to operate that I would like to go over with you. And uh, oh, here are some pictures that I took of the special little nodules that it lives in inside the roots. And this is very important. It almost looks like the, the roots of the soybean plant ha have cancer, but these are actually special little homes, these capsules, where uh, this rhizobium bacteria lives. So these are pictures that I took. I was pretty proud. I'm a terrible photographer. And, and probably someone's going, they're terrible, but they, they seem okay to me. Uh, so I uh, actually then peeled off one of these uh, capsules, these little round nodules, and I cut it open. Uh, this was kind of fun. And here's a picture of the inside. It's red. And there's an important reason for that. It's really cool. So the rhizobium bacteria actually cooperate with the plants in an amazingly mutual beneficial relationship that transforms the nitrogen uh, in the air into protein within the plant. The bacteria have been granted an enzyme called nitrogenase. This nitrogenase does not work when there's oxygen around. So the special capsule keeps oxygen away, but the bacteria need oxygen to live. So the plant and the bacteria work together and they, it creates a special molecule called leg hemoglobin. And this leg hemoglobin delivers oxygen to the bacteria, just like our hemoglobin delivers oxygen to our parts of our body. And that allows the bacteria to have the right amount of oxygen. Now to do this process, the bacteria needs a ton of energy and the plant supplies the energy in the form of ATP and sugars and different things that are needed. It's an extremely fine-tuned chemical system that functions to supply nitrogen and thus protein, not only to the plant, but to the whole world. Without this nitrogen-fixing microorganisms, life would actually run out, run out of usable nitrogen within probably years, tens of years, hundreds of years, depending on the location. Ask any farmer what the limiting problem is with plant growth, and they'll tell you it's nitrogen. Therefore, the only way that animals can have nitrogen and protein is from plants. Protein comes from plants working with this, the nitrogen-fixing bacteria, and animals eat the plants and obtain their protein this way. Now there's an important lesson we've got to learn uh, to why there's actually not a whole lot of nitrogen there. I'm going to quickly go through the history uh, in my uh, short amount of time that's left here. Throughout about 100 years ago, uh, it was noted that we, that we could not feed the people on this planet. And so scientists then, along with chemists mainly, said we've got to figure out a way to overcome the limitations that's there for growing plants. And they figured it was nitrogen, and this was about 120 years ago. Scientists came up with this process called the, the Haber-Bosch process, and it creates uh, tons of ammonia. And this allowed uh, plant growth and crop yields to greatly increase. In fact, uh, over a trillion pounds of ammonia are made this, um, in this way, in this uh, very complex process that transforms the nitrogen in the air into usable ammonia. Kind of in a way that bacteria do, except for we use a ton of heat and a ton of energy, and it ha operates at high temperatures. Plants can do it at low temperature and are way more efficient. About 1 to 2 percent of the world's energy goes into this process. 5 percent of the natural gas is consumed here. Because of this, uh, the population on our Earth was able to explode from the uh, 1 billion, uh, 1.6 billion in 1900 to the 7.7 .7 billion that we have, well, as of last November. But now we're encountering a new problem to, to combat climate change and provide enough food for 10 billion people. Uh, we've realized 
uh, we, we need to switch our protein source. And there's been a lot of articles, if you have been seeing them, that we need to switch from beef to beans, and I would posit that we need to switch all of our meat eating and protein consumption to legumes. And so if we're going to fill this earth with more people, we really need to switch. It's more efficient, it's healthier, and it's really the ultimate source of protein is from plants, not animals. How does this affirm scripture for me? In Genesis 1, 29 through 30, God said, I gave you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth, and every tree that has fruit with seed in it, they'll be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, I have given every green plant for food. It's right there. This is the way God made the planet. This is true, and that's the way we get our protein. It's all right from plants. I think it's time to make the switch and trust God that he knew what he was doing, and we should start eating our protein from plants. And that's what I have for tonight, and I hope we can learn to trust God and trust Scripture, because there's a lot of great things there to keep us healthy and alive. God bless you. Okay. So it's time for our review from yesterday evening's presentation. This time we won't be writing it out, but let me know the answers. True or false, our choices today determine our eternal destiny. This is true. This is one of the main points of yesterday evening's presentation. Okay, a multiple choice. The only thing secret about the second coming of Christ is the who, the what, the when, or the how. The when, it is the time, the day or the hour, no one knows. That is the only thing that is secret. Okay, true or false, those who are not prepared for Christ's second coming will have a second chance to get ready. False. That will not be taking place. Okay, I want to go true and false through each of these statements. So when Christ comes, is it going to be a glorious event? True. Christ will come up out of the earth. False. False. Very good. It will be an audible event. True. True. Almost every eye will see him. False. Good. I'm so happy. Every eye will see him, not almost every eye. The wicked rejoice at his coming. False. False. The dead in Christ will be raised incorruptible. True. True. And we will meet him in the air. True. True. Very good. Okay, so thank you. I'll hand over the time now for music, and then we will delve into our Bible study. That I get so scared and angry 
I need more than just a little help I need someone who will save me Come and save me I need someone to save me Who will save me Come and save me And who is this one nailed to a cross? Who would rather die than leave us lost? He's come to rescue us, come to set us free. Christ the Lord, our Savior. Do you ever feel insignificant? Sort of like maybe you don't matter or you don't count. I think everyone's probably felt those feelings at times. Um, but there's a verse in scripture that has always really meant a lot to me and even more now as a mama. And it's um, the verse really that inspired the song, the next song we're gonna sing. And it's from Isaiah, um, Isaiah 49, verses 15 and 16. And it says, can a woman forget her nursing child that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. Behold, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. As I gaze upon the heavens, all the wonders of your hands, what are we that you remember? A bit of dust in this vast expanse. We are here, but for a moment We take a breath, and then we're gone Yet you set your love upon us You've engraved us on your palms Oh, you've set your love upon us You've engraved us on your palms
All right, I'd like for you to do something. Turn to somebody near you, behind you, next to you, and, and greet them. May, make a new friend, learn a name. Very good. You know, after we do this enough nights, we actually start becoming family. I'm glad you're here. And I can see why in the Old Testament, as a part of the worship experience, there were ministers of music because God knew that joy and reflection was bound up in the heart of song. I mean, we have a whole book of the Bible just called Songs. We call it Psalms. So, you know, it's kind of a, it's a little bit of an irony. It, it seems a little strange that I would say this. You're filling up your lives because you're adding in a couple hours every night to come out and be a part of a journey into God's Word. But you know, in a way, it's kind of showing you that there's more time to be with God than you thought. Now, we couldn't keep up this pace forever. But we have five more nights after this. And I, I want to encourage you, our minds are a little bit like leaky barrels. They have to keep being filled with the things that matter most. And as you do that, these things actually become a part of you and they start making more sense. Every time I present, there's something about this journey that deepens its meaning for me. There's something about this message that reveals itself, especially about God. So I'm appealing to you tonight Look during this journey for the changes you want to make in your family schedule and your personal life because nothing is deeper and more beautiful than God. Let's pray. Father, thank you. On kind of a gray, cool night, thank you. Thank you that we can be here and have our minds and hearts touched with, in, a, in a sensory experience that whether it's closing our eyes and listening or whether it's looking at the beautiful color projected onto screens and the powerful messages of heaven in the Word. I pray, Lord, do more than teach us. I pray, touch us. And I'm praying for those, Lord, that, that we wish were watching or were here with us. I pray, give us that open door to speak to those whose lives are charged with the cares of this world. Could be work, could be studies, could just be something trifling. But I'm praying, Lord, touch lives, touch hearts, renew us and revive us and bless us as we go into the Word tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. I can put all the rest of the nights on the screen. Tomorrow night, one of the most amazing prophecies in Scripture. Hallelujah, here comes the judge. I've talked to you about the three phases of Christ's ministry. I'm going to talk about them again tonight. But tomorrow night, I'm going to show you the most amazing time prophecy in all of the Bible. You wouldn't want to miss it. On Tuesday night, I'm going to talk about something that most people have never thought about. In Revelation chapter 14, verse 6, it says that there's three angels that are flying around the world at the end. They have a megaphone. It's a very loud voice. And they are proclaiming the eternal gospel. What is it? We'll see on Tuesday night. Prophetic showdown. You know, there's going to come a point in time in which the last battle is going to be fought. And I want you to understand this battle between true and false prophets will come to an end Wednesday night. We're going to look at prophetic showdown. And then on Thursday night, 
In Revelation chapter 14, the second of the three angels says, Babylon is fallen. Come out of her, my people. If you don't know what it is, how could you come out of it? But Babylon will be destroyed, the Scriptures say. She'll fall in one day. And great will be the fall thereof. Just like literal Babylon fell. We'll look at it. Amazing history, amazing prophecy. And lastly, on Friday night, the mark of the beast. This is what everybody wants to know. It doesn't matter if you're religious or not. You just want to know what it is so you don't get it. I wish it worked that way. Knowing what it is is only part of not getting it. Come and find out what that means. But tonight, Bible prophecy and the last conspiracy. Tell me what these things have in common. What do they have in common? Don't say it out loud. Just think about it. What do they have in common? What they have in common is that there's a large segment of people around the world who believe that they were all part of a conspiracy. Nobody really walked on the moon. That was something that came out of Hollywood 50 years ago this summer. And as for the tragedy that took 3,000 plus lives on September 11, that was orchestrated by our government, some say, to attempt to get more control and take back some of the constitutional freedoms we have. And as for JFK, uh, all kinds of theories have abounded in regards to his death. Friends, I want you to know there's something about the human mind that just naturally turns to conspiracy. You want to know the truth about MLK, JFK, RFK, and Malcolm X? Well, go to somebody who thinks they've got the inside track and you can learn the latest undercover story. We love a good conspiracy. But you need to know in my job, I hate conspiracies. It's not that I don't think they exist. But can you imagine? This church has a membership of over a thousand people, especially if one fulfills a, a true prophetic role of edification, which is teaching the truth, of exhortation, which is reminding people when they're wandering from it, and of consolation, which is the work of comfort from God when one resurrenders his life. Imagine uh, working with hundreds of people. Uh, if, if all the people you know are like all the people I know, then you know all the people don't appreciate all of that all the time. And, you know, the Bible has a lot to say about gossip and negative talking. And of course, if you're a leader in God's church, all of those uh, admonitions mean a whole lot more to you. If I worried about all the conspiracies that might be working their way out inside a group of people as large as the one I'm dealing with, I would be brought to ruin. But that's not the worst part about it. If I started thinking about the evil things, and by the way, I tell my church I know more bad things about all of you than anybody else. And that's how it is with Jesus too. But you know, uh, not that my love is like His, but my love comes from Him. He loves you and the members of this church I love. And I look at them through the eyeglasses of Christ. I don't look through them through the conspiratorial eyeglasses. If I did, I'd be ruined. I'd see evil instead of seeing good. Do you understand what I'm talking about? There's something about the human heart that isn't trusting in God that is naturally very afraid and understanding what's going on behind the scenes is a way of hedging oneself against the future. And who wouldn't want to do that? I mean, the world's becoming more insecure all the time. It's unraveling not just at the edges but almost at the center, you think. And conspiracy theories are abounding because people lie and they don't tell the truth and they hide things and they're deceitful. And it's no wonder that people don't trust each other, so there's got to be a backstory. And if everybody's as selfish as I am, then they're always looking out for themselves anyway, and you can see why conspiracies sell. But I want to tell you, there's going to be a group on the face of the earth at the end of time who rise above it all. They don't live duplicious lives. They are not hypocritical. They're pure because Christ is in them. They're sincere because Christ is in them. They're truthful because Christ is in them. And this communion and this community will rise up out of the ashes of a decaying culture and people will be drawn to it first because of the beauty of Christ that's in the fellowship and after that, the teachings that explain why. And I try to tell people it's better for people to taste and see that the Lord is good than for you to try to convince them that He is. I didn't have to figure it out when I was a young Christian. 
I saw. I experienced it. My teachers in that church school I went to when I was thrust into it as a 13-year-old didn't want to go. Listen, friends, Christian education is a sanctuary in a polluting culture, a defiling culture in our age. And that Christian teacher that would read me worship in the morning was a Christian through the rest of the day. And I'll tell you what, I fell in love with Jesus through my teacher. Christianity is powerful when it's lived out and it's repulsive when it's only proclaimed. We must live what we teach or what we teach will be impotent. It will have no power. And the world's gotten used to that. Even the Christian world. And I put Christian in quote marks. Yes, you want to know the real dirt? Look for somebody who's got something negative to say that everybody else doesn't know. Then you'll be in the know. You'll be one leg up on everybody else and you won't be duped. But it doesn't work that way. The big problem with conspiracy thinking is it trains you to look for evil. That's what it trains you to do. It also makes you suspicious and afraid. And I want you to read a quote from one of my favorite authors. It says, the very act of looking for evil in others develops the evil in those who look. Should we be surprised? Didn't Paul write to the Corinthians, by beholding you become changed? The third thing it does is it robs, us of a, robs God of a powerful witness. Did Daniel have a conspiracy against him? Yes or no? Absolutely. Did he go try to work the levers, levers politically and administratively to get himself out of it? No, he opened his window and he prayed. And he knew they were watching on the street and listening. And they thought they had him, except for one thing, God was bigger than the conspiracy. Can you say amen? How about Joseph? Was there a conspiracy to destroy him? You bet there was. Started with his brothers. Then it moved over to Potiphar's wife. After a while, he was completely forgotten about by the baker and the butler who were in prison. If you were Joseph, you could get pretty discouraged except for one thing. He kept living out the principles of his father's God who had become his God and you couldn't keep him down. God kept lifting him up and one day he became the prime minister of the most powerful country on the face of the planet. Was there a conspiracy against Jesus, yes or no? Did he get all mad about it and try to, try to point it out to them? Occasionally he did announce that he knew they were trying to kill him and the people in the crowd thought he was crazy for saying it. But you bet there was a conspiracy against Jesus, but was it the focus of his life? Absolutely not. And was God able to win in the end? Yes, it looked like they won in the beginning because he was laying in a tomb after hanging on a cross. But when the ground shook on Sunday morning and the angel stood at the front of the tomb and said, Son of man, thy father calls thee. Jesus took up his life on his own power. He said, I have the power to lay it down and I have the power to take it up again. And he raised up out of the tomb. And I want to tell you what, conspiracy or no, God's going to win. But don't get stuck in him, friends. Hit the spam button. Tune out that person. Save them because it robs God of a powerful witness. You don't have to know the latest dirt. There's nothing wrong with understanding to a point. I'm not suggesting here that we go on a, a, a Pollyanna journey through life, but I am suggesting that while we must become acquainted with some of the evil that is in the world, we never allow our focus to go there because in the end, conspiracy or no, God's got my life in his hands. And I may go down for a while, but my Bible says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down for the Lord upholds him with his hand. I stumble, yes. Jesus stumbles, no. And he pulls me back up and he says, son, let's keep walking. John the Baptist said, a man can only have what God gives him. Your estate in life is a function of obeying the principles and the precepts of life. You go outside of them, you suffer. You live inside of them, you succeed. But also, God places you to do a certain role at a certain time, a certain way. Do it well. It's the preparation for the next thing. The fourth thing is it eclipses faith and it steals peace. Sit around agitating about all the evil in the world and how they're out to get you. So what? My Bible says God's a shield to those who walk uprightly. Have you never read that? You're not immune from suffering even at the hands of other people. 
But you need to know something. Focusing on conspiracies robs you of a strengthening faith. Someday the conspiracies are going to come out in the open, and you're going to need that faith. And lastly, it reinforces legalism. Why? Because nobody's looking out for me, so I'll have to do it myself. And the way I do it is to know more than everybody else. And I'm going to be a step ahead. Listen, friends, we're going to the kingdom trusting in the shepherding care of Jesus Christ, not how much we can know about what's going down before everybody else knows it's going down. Conspiracies leave you fearful and afraid with nothing you can do about it. So is there conspiracy? You think it worked? They're trying to hold you down? They may be. But you know what? In the right time, in the right way, God exalts in the way he wants to exalt. It's a form of self-preservation in the end. How many of you have read this book? This predates me. Well, maybe you read this one. Ah, that was my introduction. And maybe you can appreciate this one. Do you remember Nipa? He hated the missionaries. And where did they have the missionaries build their house? On the enchanted, wicked, cursed ground. That's the best place in the world for a missionary to build their house. He, the missionary didn't know it. But everybody in the village knew the missionary's house was on that wicked ground. Was it a conspiracy? You bet it was. If you haven't read the book, friends, get it. The only bad news I have is if you go to Amazon, Amazon to buy it, even a paperback version is $20, and a new version is $47. Go down to our ABC. I bet you can get it for less. This is what the Bible says, like a flitting sparrow, like a flying swallow, so a curse without a cause shall not alight. Listen, you can walk through the darkest, you can walk through the darkest valley with Jesus. They can curse you all they want, but unless God allows it to land on you, you're walking in the light, just like Jesus said. When a man's way pleases the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Friends, one of the things about the end times is that while men's hearts are failing them of fear, even when we're being persecuted, we have peace and we're not afraid, and it's a sign of perdition to those who are seeking our life and well-being. Think about it. We got to look up. We got to look at Jesus. We can't be following too much of this stuff. Did God really say? God knows. Here's the first conspiracy. He's hiding something from you. Was he? Well, yes and no. (laughs) Because surely enough, he never wanted them to face and to feel and understand what evil was. But the devil's slick, and he knows. Come now, God says, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they're red like crimson, they shall be as wool. You were given a mind like God's, and while it retains only a portion of its intellectual horsepower, God still has always resorted to the same thing. He says it's the truth that sets you free. When you sit down and you reason with God, if you're an honest person, you can say, God, I don't deserve it. Just like the songs we heard about tonight. Why would God take any attention of us? We were his enemies. And yet God gives this invitation. I'm willing to sit down and reason. Thy way, O God, we learned, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as you? And tonight I want to remind you of three things as I launch into this topic because these three things are the main pillars upon which the plan of salvation is built. In the outer court, we have the ministry of Jesus as a sacrifice. In the holy place, we have the ministry of Jesus building and opening up a relationship with the holy God who sits in the most holy place. And someday, like on the Day of Atonement in the experience of the Hebrew family, God on that one day would vindicate his people and their, and their God, himself. And the sins would be cleansed from the sanctuary. And this little, this little sandbox story of salvation has become the main pillar upon which we can understand what God is doing in different phases of earth's history. So Jesus is the lamb. He's the sacrifice. Jesus is the mediator. He's the priest, our high priest. And Jesus is the judge. Lamb of God, John the Baptist said, 
Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Paul writes in the book of Hebrews that he ever lives to make intercession for us. And we understand that someday he's going to proclaim those who are holy, let them be holy still. And those that are filthy, let them be filthy still. Three phases of God's ministry to redeem the planet and exonerate his own name. Yes, you see, it's very important, sacrifice, mediation, and vindication. We've seen this before. I want it to be drilled into your mind. You could explain this to a child, and they could understand. So Jesus, as you look at the elements of the sanctuary, opens the door by his sacrifice. From the outer court at the altar of sacrifice into the place where the showbread, the lamp, and the incense, and finally on the Day of Atonement, in the presence of God himself. This is what Jesus said of Lucifer. He said of the Pharisees, you're of your father the devil. And the desires of your father you want to do. They wanted to kill him. He was a murderer from the beginning and he does not stand in the truth. Conspiracy, yes, Jesus is confronting it here. He knows they want to kill him because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. One version says he speaks his native tongue for he's a liar and the father of lies. I don't know that Satan could ever utter a true statement. He's twisted the facts such he thinks he's right and doesn't understand he's wrong, and he lies continually. But God's the opposite. He cannot lie, and the author of Hebrews will say it's impossible for God to lie. Have you ever gone to the state fair, and they have a tent, and they ask you, what is it impossible for God to do? This makes it onto the list. But this is what John says, the message which we've heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is how much darkness? None. No darkness at all. And tonight, I want you to understand God has nothing to hide. And that's my subject matter. Everything God does is to ensure security for now and for eternity. So let's see at Abraham's encounter with God. He was visited once. Abraham was. And he looked down toward Sodom, and Abraham went with them, and he said on the way, Shall I hide from Abraham the thing which I'm going to do? I want you to understand the scenario. Lot has gone down to live in Sodom and Gomorrah. God himself has come to visit Abraham. He's going to tell Abraham that he's going to destroy the cities of the plain. And the conversation is an interesting one. Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. And the men turned their faces from thence and they went to Sodom. But Abraham stood yet before the Lord and Abraham drew near and he said, will you destroy the righteous with the wicked? It's an earnest question. His nephew and all of his, his nephew's children are down there. He knows everybody in Sodom isn't bad. But God said, the wickedness has risen up. It's like in the days of Noah. And it's time for me to do something about it. We've gone past the point of redemption. And they're polluting the whole general environment around which people who traverse through their city precincts come. And Abraham says, you won't kill them all, will you? You won't kill the good and the bad. Peradventure, there be 50 righteous within the city. Will thou destroy and not spare the place for 50 righteous that are therein? And God assure, assures him, far be it from thee to do this, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked. That be far from thee. And he works his way all the way down from 50 to 40 to 30 to 20 to 10. And the question is, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? The other night we asked ourselves, can a man be more righteous than God? Tonight we're asking, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? There's three phases of ministry. Would the one who died for us and thought it cost him eternal separation, that second death, that's what Jesus felt when he hung on the cross and he said, my God, my God, why have you left me? He was experiencing not just dying as a human, he was experiencing dying the eternal death. And even though he went forward in faith trusting his father, he thought he was paying the eternal price. Would the God who paid the eternal price for all of us not do right? Or how about the God who's nursing all of us through our sicknesses spiritually, physically, mentally, and socially? We once tried to raise puppies. We had a little Shetland sheepdog. Her name was Sandy. We had four puppies, 
rags, wags, tags. I know it wasn't very creative, was it? <laughs> but it was a story from my wife's little girlhood where she had read a book, Rags, Wags, Tags, and Ob Obadiah. One of those dogs got sick. Now I'm here to tell you, if you're a sentimental type, don't try to raise dogs for money because you feel like you're selling your children. Rags got sick. And uh, we actually took her to one of those emergency vets which assured us of the fact that we would make no money. And you know, eventually, after sleeping on the kitchen floor with the puppy and nursing it through the night, I can't sell this dog. <laughs> but I couldn't keep it either, so we gave it away to our brother and sister-in-law. So the dog was still sort of in the family. If a human has that much compassion for an animal that will live 10 or 12 years, what does God have for Billions of people made in His image. Shall not the judge of the earth do right? If it was your child, what would you do? This is the issue that's at hand. Jesus warned us to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy, for there's nothing covered that will not be revealed, nor hidden that will not be known. Listen, friends, it's all being written down. There's a book of remembrance. Your motivations are even being recorded. We think that the NSA has scads and scads of data on us. I want to tell you something. It's nothing like heaven. All of our 80 or 90 or, or less years are all recorded, both from the motivation that prompts the act to the act itself and to what we do to make it wrong or make it right. But Jesus warned us. He was warning the scribes and the Pharisees, don't live a double life. Don't make a profession of this and live like this because it's all being written down and everybody's going to see it someday. He goes even farther. Whatever you have spoken in the dark will be heard in the light, and whatever you've spoken in the air and the inner rooms will be proclaimed on the housetops. I'm telling you, there's some things I've done I don't want shouted from the housetops. But I say to you that for every idle word men speak, they will give an account in the day of judgment. And you could go out of here feeling like, man, I'm in trouble. And you know, without Jesus, everybody is. But with Jesus, the blood of the Lamb purges the record and cleanses the heart. And I don't have to worry because I've passed from judgment into life. Amen? And this is for you too, if you receive him. But everything's being written down and everything's going to be looked at. This is the record of scriptures. Don't be confused. There is an absolute sense of justice and it will be dealing with facts. Nothing is secret that will not be revealed nor anything hidden that will not come to light. So let's get to ending the conspiracies, could we? Let's remind ourselves there's two judgments don't marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which those who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forward. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Tomorrow night, I'm going to talk about this. But Jesus says when he comes to get us, his reward is with us. What does that mean? That means before he came to get us, he had already decided there had already been a phase of the judgment because he's coming with the reward. And tomorrow night, I'm going to explain to you another component of the judgment. The angels are all satisfied with Christ's decision. I'm going to show you why tomorrow night they're satisfied. But the scriptures are very clear. Jesus comes with his reward. They've already examined our lives. The Bible says judgment begins in the house of God and it begins with those who make a profession. And when Jesus comes to get us, our fate is sealed in the blood of the Lamb. But there is another resurrection, which is the resurrection of damnation. Two and though they be, life or damnation. One happens when Jesus comes. One happens after the end of the thousand years. The Scripture is exceptionally clear about this. God comes down Himself. He doesn't pawn it off to a lesser angel. He comes down to get us. He wants to be there. It's going to be audible, visible, glorious, literal, and God's going to raise us up, and we're going to go to heaven. And the reward, our lives, our bodies will be changed. We will be raised incorruptible. And we who are alive and remain will be caught up together in the clouds. The wicked are slain by the brightness of His coming. The wicked in the graves remain there. But those that are alive in Christ and those that have died in Christ are both brought up together in the clouds and will be with God. Blessed and holy, Revelation says, to who has part in that resurrection. On such the second death has no power. Glory, hallelujah. But they shall be priests of God 
and of Christ. They shall reign with Him a thousand years. I don't want you to miss this. The story of the last angel to the Laodiceans is that if we overcome, we will sit on Christ's throne. When you sit on a throne, you have power and authority. You see, we will be in the scope of the cosmos for all eternity. We will be with Christ the judges. He became one of us. We became just like Him. We share a unique experience in time and eternity. And we will not only reign with Him for a thousand years, we will go reigning with Christ throughout eternity, having shared the most gruesome and glorious experience that can be known. Two groups. The saved and the lost. What a sad thing to think one would see Jesus who died on a cross as your enemy. The events at Christ's coming are like this. The believers are resurrected. They receive immortality. The wicked are consumed. The wicked dead remain in their graves. And the believers ascend to heaven with Jesus. But what happens after Jesus comes when all of that is done? And what is the condition of the earth? What happens to Satan? And when does God make the earth new? During that thousand years, is anybody alive? The word is millennium. Milli, meaning thousand. Annum, meaning year. This is a thousand year period. Now, some people say it happens before Jesus comes. There just isn't any way. Christ is allowing us a unique experience during that thousand years. And remember, part of what's being fixed are the lies, the conspiratorial lies about God Himself. It's been said that He's hiding something, that He's the real problem. Move Him out of the way, Satan says, and let me handle things and it won't be like this. That millennium is part of the period of time in which God Himself is exonerated. But after Christ comes, and this world's gone through the seven plagues, the brightness of Christ's coming, the convulsion of that call to wake the dead, this world's not in such good shape. The word is abusos or abyss. This world is looking like it was before God created it. The words are the same. The earth was form without form and void. It was abusos. It's going to be a terrible looking place when Jesus is all done. What's good news to us will be bad news to the devil. This world will be destroyed. It will be looking like something none of us would want to look at. Jeremiah, speaking of it, describes it as such. I beheld the earth, and indeed it was without form and void. And the heavens, they had no light. Sounds like creation in reverse. When the first verses in the Bible say, let there be light, it appears that the world is almost back where it started from. Except, unfortunately, in the beginning it had no blight of sin. I beheld the mountains and indeed they trembled and all the hills moved back and forth. I beheld indeed there was no man and all the birds of the heavens have fled and indeed the fruitful land was a wilderness. Thus says the Lord, the whole land shall be desolate yet I will not make a full end of it. And at that day the slain shall be from one end of the earth even to the other end of the earth. We shouldn't be surprised, should we? Satan doesn't care. He can live in a wreck He's certainly not going to give a respectful treatment to a body that's made in honor and replication of Christ and some merit. The dead people will be laying all over the face of the planet. It's a gruesome thought. I don't even like to say it. But Jeremiah says it, and it's true. They shall not be lamented or gathered or buried. They shall become refuse on the ground. So let's go to that actual chapter in the Bible that talks about it. The millennium, I saw an angel coming down from heaven having a key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil, Satan, and he bound him for a thousand years. What is that binding? What are these chains? God tells us he's reserved a moment for Satan and his angels and that they will be delivered into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. God's people have been vindicated, but Satan is on the earth. Is he in a literal chain? Or is it simply the fact that he has shown himself to all of the inhabitants of the universe, including the holy angels, as one totally unfit to associate with? No one will have anything to do with him. This morning from my own personal devotional life, I read the first few chapters of the book of Job. Very interesting read. You read about it and it appears that there is some kind of senate in heaven And Satan gets to represent, or did get to represent this planet. And he came to that Senate, 
And God said, where have you come from? And he said, from roaming back and forth on, the, on planet earth. And he said, have you considered my servant Job? You need to understand something. For a thousand years, Satan's going to be all tied up with a set of circumstances, mainly because his mask has been torn off and everybody see him for who he is. At the cross, the holy angels said, that's enough. We don't need to see anymore. We now understand. God revealed the plan of salvation in the story of his people. Paul writes in the book of Ephesians that this little world is a theater. The angels have been watching and we are the actors, the main deliverer. The only deliverer is Jesus, but he calls us into a journey of deliverance as well. But after the whole story is told and the long dark night of sin is closed for God's people, there will be a longer dark night for Satan. Nobody has anything to do with them. They're not literal chains. They're the result of his choices. And by the way, friends, if you've ever gotten yourself into an addiction or made a bad decision, you know that those are the chains that are the gall most galling to wear. Satan, by God's design, is exiled to planet Earth, which is not a pretty place to be. And I'm afraid that picture, and this one's just a little bit too nice because for the sake of you looking, have you ever been in a cave where there's no light? As a little boy, we used to go over to Hannibal, Missouri, and we'd go in the Mark Twain cave, and they'd get us down in the bowels of the earth, and then they'd turn the lights off. And I could have had my hand right here and not seen it. The Bible says the sun isn't going to shine. This is the only thing he has to look forward to, which is the judgment that's coming at the end of the thousand years. But it's not because God is exceptionally uh, desirous to make him suffer. Something's going on in heaven. Is there anyone alive on earth? Well, only the evil angels and Satan. Everybody else is dead on the face of the planet. But in heaven, something is going on. The holy ones that were the saints that were resurrected and the saints that were alive, they've got something to do. They're not worried. They're not afraid. They're priests of God and they're reigning for a thousand years. But what are they doing? The Bible says that God is there explaining to, him what the explaining to them what the future holds because at the end of that thousand years, there's going to be judgment. But before there's execution in this judgment, there's going to be investigation. Nobody's going to stand back and say, whoa, that was overkill. That was too much. Why did God do that? You see, some of the people on the outside of the city are going to be people we know. God forbid. May our lives have a divine purpose and beauty so that nobody misses their eternal inheritance already paid for by Christ. But there's going to be people on the outside of the city. When the city comes down at the end of the thousand years, we're going to see people in the crowd we know. And some of them will be historical figures for which we have no emotional attachment. And some of them are going to be people that we have loved and prayed for and wrestled for on our knees. You see, God has to make sure the universe is secure for eternity. Thrones were put up. We sat on them. Judgment was committed to us. Judgment. God is not moving forward with the final acts of vindicating His own name and executing the rebels for which there is no future hope of redemption. He's not going forward until judgment happens and that judgment is committed to you and me. Now listen. If you don't know how to lovingly, as a parent... If you don't know how to lovingly as a teacher, if you don't know how to lovingly as a pastor, if you don't know how to lovingly as a manager, if you don't know how to lovingly execute kind and fair justice now, do you think you're going to make the big leap in the future? Listen. The Bible says when a righteous judge rules the land, the people rejoice. Is it because he's a pushover? No. It's because truth matters and mercy is in the ming intermingled in that judgment. But judgment's going to be committed to them by God's grace to us. It's quite a statement. The books were opened. It's going to be data-driven. It's not how much I like somebody or how much you love somebody else. It's going to be about the facts. The facts are that Christ can change a life. The facts are God can cleanse a record. The facts are that we can be safe in the arms of Jesus today and assured of vindication in the future. But by this time, the facts are finished. During the millennium, God's going to answer every single question. You're going to be able to look into the lives. You'll have a full intelligence. You will have met under the tree of life with all of those that you had been redeemed with. But there are going to be wonderings in your mind. I'm still looking for so-and-so. 
It may come to the point and the time in which you realize that so-and-so is not there. And Jesus is going to say, come here. Let's talk. He's going to show us everything he ever did. He's going to show us every angel that came. He's going to reveal how the Holy Spirit put this impress and this conviction and this comfort into their life. And the, the evidence is going to be so overwhelming. It's going to be like, you know, you've heard people say it's like drinking from a fire hydrant. I'm going to tell you, as we look at the data and we see what God has done to save, it's going to be like standing at the base of Niagara Falls and you're going to realize everything that could have been done was done. It isn't going to change the fact that your heart aches and that you're sad. But the issues of judgment mingled with mercy will be complete. You will know God is love. Every question about His justice, every concern about His loving action will be completely answered. You've read over these verses before and not thought much about them. Paul wants to know why nobody in the church in Corinth has enough judgment to keep their church matters from not going public. Could we not deal with this in private? Now, not everything can be done that way. And not everything today is exactly as it was then, but there's a point he's trying to make. Do you have to take it to the public judges? He says, don't you know that the saints will judge the world? Paul got it. He understood these three phases of the sanctuary. He knew Christ was the propitiation, the the substitute for us. He knew Jesus ever lived to make intercession. And he also knew that Jesus wanted to pronounce us holy and holy for eternity. But he also knew some would be pronounced filthy and filthy for eternity. He goes on and he says, it's not just people. Do you not know that you shall judge the angels? All those questions you've had about how did Lucifer become Satan, you're going to read about it. You're going to hear about it. Jesus is going to go through the agonizing story with you. And a few tears will well up in your eyes when you hear about Christ himself pleading for Lucifer to turn back. And you're going to hear the story of how close he came. But then he said, no, it'd be too embarrassing, too humiliating. Yes, friends, you're going to sit on thrones. You're going to open the books. You're going to look into the story because God has nothing to hide. When heaven's books are fully opened, we will fully understand. During the millennium, the righteous are in heaven. The wicked are dead on the face of the planet. Satan and his angels are bound because nobody will have anything to do with them. They're exiled to earth like John was exiled to Patmos. He doesn't need a literal chain. God just needs to speak it, and it's so, and earth remains desolate. But after the millennium, the wicked dead are resurrected. They come. The rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. These are those who died as rebels, who died without being willing to yield the human heart to the remaking touch of Christ. On the front side of the millennium is the resurrection of life. On the back side of the millennium is the resurrection of damnation. That thousand-year period is for us. It's for us. At the end of the millennium, the Christians and the saints and the raised will descend. The city comes down. The wicked dead are raised. Satan is loosed. The last judgment is about to be enacted. Satan and his sinners will be destroyed and the earth will be cleansed. Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from prison. Why? Because all of his wicked subjects have come back to life and he can do something with them. They'll go, he will go out and deceive the nations where you're in the four corners of the earth and you say, deceive? What's there to deceive about? The deception is we can still win. That's why they attack the city. Their numbers is the sand of the sea. It appears that those inside the city are outnumbered, but it doesn't matter. God is with them. John says in chapter 21, he saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven with God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And then the announcement is, let's get them. But I'm going to tell you before they do that, I reminded you last night, Paul says in Philippians chapter 2 that every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the honor and the glory of the Father. They are looking at the city. They've surrounded it. It looks like they can do it. And they go up and the fire comes down and the final judgment is carried out as I've described to you over the last several nights. It's not an eternal burning hell fire. It's enough to end the rebellion. That's all it needs to be. It is as merciful and as quick 
as God can make it, and it is as heart-wrenching as only you could imagine it. Those transparent walls of gold standing there either on them or in them and seeing somebody on the outside realizing they could be with you on the inside. Indeed, friends, the Scriptures describe this as God's strange act. The Lord shall rise up as in Mount Perizim. He shall be wroth as in the valley of Gibeon. When you read this in Isaiah chapter 8, God's been appealing to Israel, the ten tribes of the north, and to Judah, the two tribes of the south. And you read the chapter and God says, you've made a pact so that death isn't going to get you. God said, your pact isn't going to stand. Unfortunately, God had given victories in Perizim and victories in Gibeon. You remember when, when they were fighting there and Joshua said, sun, stand still over Gibeon and moon over Ajalon. These were mighty, amazing victories. God did what he said he would do. Unfortunately, for so many of the Old Testament prophets, God's people were resistant to the voice of the Holy Spirit, and they ignored and rejected the counsel to turn back and repent. And this is why most prophets are not received, because the call is a call to repentance. But God says, I'm going to act. It'll just be, I'll use that dynamic power that was once for victory. It's going to have to be used to teach you a painful lesson that he may do his work, his strange work, and bring to act his strange act. No parent raises their children for destruction. No ever, at at not one single moment, has God anticipated any delight in the death of the wicked. Ezekiel says, as I live, saith the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that they turn, turn and live, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die? Can you imagine the God who spoke the cosmos into the, into existence? The the astronomers tell us now there's more stars than there are sand uh, grains on the seashore. This God, when, when David says in Psalm 8, what is man that you're mindful of him? Paul tells us that in Christ all died, so in Christ all can live. Can you imagine Jesus pleading? Why? Why would you choose death? This is the best picture I've ever seen to describe the moment. God's heart breaking. You've heard that song by Selah. Speaking of that moment at the cross where it says the father turned his face away. Well, there's more than one moment when God turns his face away. Why do you conspire against the Lord? Another Old Testament prophet, he will make her utter end of it. But he has a transcendent meaning in this little minor prophet. And what he tells us is, The sin problem will never rise up again. Why? Because God has revealed every secret of the universe to every human being. Every question has been answered. Every page has been turned. Every file has been examined. And nobody doubts for a second that God is love. I'll wipe every tear away from their eyes. Why is God crying? Why those secret tears? It's like I shared with you out of Jeremiah 13. They were God's children before they were yours. They're God's family too. Just and righteous are thy ways, O Lord. You see, friends, at the end of the millennium, there is something that separates us from the joy and the beauty of the environment. And that is the divine touch to heal the heartache, the godlike heartache. This is why we sit on the throne. God and we have experienced the same things. The events at the end of the millennium are not complete until Jesus wipes the tears out of our eyes. A thousand years is barely long enough to make sure we're okay before God steps in and lets it come to its completion. He's gonna make sure we're okay. We're more than okay. Look at it once. Go away and think about it. Come back, we'll look at it again. Cry on my shoulder. Jesus, hold us close. I know it's gotta come, it's just hard. Jesus says, I know. We can't have this 
without having the touch of Jesus, says, I completely understand. A new heaven and a new earth is going to need the divine touch of Jesus before it's a happy place. After we watch what we had to see, yes, it's the agony of God's heart. There's no more sin, there's no more suffering, and eventually there's no more sorrow. You know how it is. Somebody breaks up with you. Somebody you love gets sick. Somebody loses their job. Worst of all, somebody dies. It takes a while before you're okay. A lot of days in which you just wish you could hold their hand, hear their voice. Jesus knows those days will be perpetually, permanently done. But you have some memories. It's like a scar. It's there because there was a wound. Those scars on the hands of Jesus represent pain we'll never fully understand. But we understand it better than the angels. But when it's all said and done, no one will ever say, God is trying to hide something from us. Let's listen. After the last tear falls, after the last secrets told, after the last bullet tears through flesh and bone, after the last child starves and the last girl walks the boulevard. After the last year that's just too hard There is love, 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 love There is love After the last disgrace After the last lie to save some face After the last brutal jab From a poisoned tongue after the last dirty politician After the last meal down at the mission After the last lonely night in prison There is love, 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 love There is love And in the end, the end is oceans and oceans of love and love the tears that have fallen were caught in the palms of the giver of love and the lover of all and will look back on these tears as old tales cause after the last plan fails after the last siren wails after the last young husband Sails off to join the war After the last this marriage is over After the last young girl's innocence is stolen After the last years of silence That won't let a heart open There is love, 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 love There is love How the tears that have fallen were caught in the palms of the giver of love and the lover of all and will look back on these tears as old tales cause after the last tear falls there is love After the last tear falls, there is love. Friends, these are the most sublime subjects 
ever to be wrestled with, reflected on, and meditated on by man. And the world, even including some of our own church, is too busy to stop and say, what an awesome God we serve. I'm appealing to you. If there's a question mark that stands in your mind about who is God, stop for a moment and think about what he paid to be the author of love and the lover of all. If somebody's been thrown up into the bus, if somebody's been run over by inconsideration and lack of response, if love has been unrequited, the one whose heart is broken the most is God's. And tonight, I'm appealing to you. Give your heart to Christ again. There's lots of theories out there about how the prophecies end up, but I'm here to tell you, if you'll start with the simplest paradigm, sacrifice, mediator, and vindicator, you'll see that no page will be left unturned because God has nothing to hide. I know there's questions. I know the devil tries to make you doubt. But to know him is to love him. So tomorrow morning when you wake up and the night before you go to bed, kneel down by your bed and say, Lord, it's a mystery too big for me to fully comprehend, but what I understand calls me to a new devotion. That's one of the main reasons we do these meetings. We sometimes forget. Some of you, many of you have heard this message before, a message like it. But we forget, really, the great pillars of mercy and justice, grace and truth that this amazing invitation to be a child of God is built on. He paid the price because we couldn't do it. But he'll never run over our intelligence or our emotional desire to understand. So I'm appealing to you tonight one more time. It won't be the last time. But may Jesus have everything that is you. And let him show you more of what is him. If you're willing to do that tonight, I invite you to stand. Let's pray. Lord, sometimes we hear these things and it's like, oh yeah, 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 we know. We've rushed right on by all the obvious things that are involved because we didn't slow down long enough to think about what it will be like. I've only scratched the surface tonight, Lord. It's probably wrong that we don't come to this treasure chest of understanding about how great and good you are more often. Bless us tonight, Lord. May our hearts be sensitive and tender. May we not be afraid to love, to risk, to suffer. For this is the journey of our God and our Savior and our Redeemer. Thank you for pouring all of omnipotence into the journey to redeem us all the tenderness, all the patience. Give it to us, Lord, for those we're trying to reach. And bless us now as we go from this place with such an assurance that you can be trusted. Help us to understand better now in our own lives, I pray. And go with us, Lord, as we go rejoicing that there will be a day when there are no more conspiracies and no more doubts. Until then, Lord, may we live by faith in the promises and get to know you better is my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow night. There are some light refreshments. God be with you, and we hope you have a wonderful, blessed rest of your Sunday night. One more thing before you go. This is the last night. We have Josie and Matt with us. So if you wanted some music to take with you, go see their booth. This is the last night they're with us. God be with you.